Welcome to our uh, Albany State University town hall meeting. Uh, this is not really a second part. I was going to add that in there, but we had one on Wednesday, I believe, of last week at Darton State College, and that was very successful. And these gentlemen, um, this is part two, I'm going to say it anyway, here at Albany State University with Dr. Art Dunning and Dr. Richard Carvajal to give you an update as it relates to the consolidation, and then we'll transition to any questions and answers, uh, questions that you may have, and they will answer those for you. Once we get to that period, uh, Mr. Christian will, uh, if you could just raise your hand and then he will bring the mic to you to get those questions asked and then answered. And so now I'll transition and begin with uh, Dr. Dunning, President of Albany State University. Ms. Wilson, thank you very much. And let me give you some context and maybe a, a refresher on how we arrived at this point last November at the Regents meeting in Atlanta, the board chose to pass a resolution where they would consolidate two campuses in southwest Georgia. The two campuses are 4.3 miles apart, and that is Darden State College and Albany State University. And we were number seven in the process. They've consolidated six already. Years ago in the system there were 35, we're down, down, to, down to 29. And part of that consolidation process has been to be more efficient and effective with resources for the taxpayers of Georgia. That there are so many demands on what we need every year to take care of state needs, ranging from elementary schools, high schools, to prisons, to higher education. So there are limited resources. The other thing that was looked at in, for Southwest Georgia, we are the poorest section of the state. There are 26 counties uh, that in the top two quartiles of poverty for the last 30 years. If you look at the U.S. Census data, uh, we are the section in the country, and especially in Georgia. Not just the 26 counties, Georgia has 159 counties. Nine of those counties are in the top two quartiles of poverty in the United States. The second congressional district, which is our congressional district, is number 419 out of 435. So we have some unusually difficult challenges facing the people of this region. When the board looked at our two campuses, they suggested and said higher education is part of the solution for Southwest Georgia. And how do we become more efficient and effective in delivering those resources? And how can we aggregate those resources in a way that gives us more return on investment? And one of the things that is so necessary for us is the whole idea of an economic vital area, economic vitality is huge for us. That means jobs in a very different way. We were asked to look at not just the existing programs at our campus and at Darden's campus, but can you come out of this process recommending to us those jobs that can be filled by new majors, whether that's supply chain and logistics or emerging and current jobs in the health sector. One of the things we know, the fastest growing population in southwest Georgia will be persons over 65 years of age. Demographically, we're not going to grow very much in the next 15 years uh, except for a very, very slight rate. Our demand and need, if we want to grow, we're going to have to have people to come into our area to study at this new Albany State University and to indeed stay here. So the growth is not going to be in this part of the state. The growth is projected to be north of Macon. For about a 10-year period from 95 to 2005, the city of Atlanta and the 25 or 30 counties around Atlanta added about a million people. So the growth in that part of the state was exploding. We have had a lot of out-migration from our region. That out-migration is not very new. It started really in, in probably the late 40s to the mid-60s. We lost 4.1 million people from the South and generally the 12 or 13 Southern states. Much of that migration to the Northeast was lost out of Georgia. And people in Georgia followed the Atlantic seaboard to move out of this state. So the migration has been leaving and going on for a long time. That has left us with a population base that's hard to sustain and across this state where I think out of the 29 campuses, the 11 or 12 that have lost enrollment Albany State is one, Darton has lost enrollment. They're in the southern part of the state. The campus that have grown very much is in the northern part. 
that impacts the people we have who can major in subjects here, who can go to school here, stay and get a job and to make this community work. So the Regents had took all of that context into, into uh, consideration November the 10th when they made this decision. They made a decision to do two or three things. One, we would keep our name at Albany State University. The campus name would stay the same. The second thing they did was to look at the two campuses and they were very specific that we would have an open access mission, which is the uh, responsibility that DART has had historically. We would maintain our HBCU mission, which is codified in federal law, the 1965 Higher Education Act. Many of you may know this, but for a uh, hundred years after the U.S. Civil War, from 1861 to 1865 was the U.S. Civil War. After that, you had a legalized system put in place called, uh, and commonly called the American Jim Crow system, or what it was, legalized segregation. That ended in 1964 when Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act. The second thing that he did the next year was to sign, to sign the Voting Rights Act. And in 65, you also had the Title III Higher Education Act, which gave us the HBCU mission. We have that and we'll continue to keep that. Darden will become one of the colleges of Albany State University. It'll be, we have four colleges. We will have a fifth college. <clears throat> and that college will address the needs of the health professions in Southwest Georgia. Historically, that's what that campus has done and done well. So we've gone through a lot of processes. We have about eight or nine hundred discrete decisions that we'll have to make. And the university system gave us a template of how to do this because they looked at the other six. One is have operational work groups. And we will have work groups like they had at other places that are co-chaired by a person from Albany State and one from Darden to look at every single aspect of public higher education on these two campuses, so the operational work groups. We also have something called the functional area work groups, as well, uh, functional area groups, which provide sort of the first level of review to see what information is needed and give us some feedback. And then the group that provides the overall leadership is 20 people from Albany State and 20 people from Darton. That's the Consolidation Implementation Committee. That committee uh, looks at all the recommendations that flows up from the operational work groups. So you have a huge, huge number of people who are involved in these conversations. And as you would expect, with any consolidation, it's a complicated process. Almost every moving part, whether it comes from, whether it's academic programs or human resources, or whether or not we're getting public support, state, federal, government, and private, we look at every aspect of that. So that process is on the way. This is about an 18 to 24 month process. We're almost six months into this process now. We started very much in, uh, when the regents approved this in November, but we didn't get on the way heavily until after the, after the new year when we began to put the committees in place and identify people to help us with this. Uh, what we have chosen to do that's different from the other campuses, we have a, not just a consolidation implementation committee and a consolidate, consolidation website. We've done town hall meetings. We've talked to many, many groups in and around Albany, Georgia. We've talked to superintendents. We've talked to business people. We've talked to members of the faith community. We have a town hall meeting here. I think this is the second one. We've had one at Darton last week. So we're trying to get out to make sure that what they have used successfully at other places but did not seem to work for us, which is the consolidation website. Many people do not go to it and find that information. So this is an example of where we are able to provide you with the context and update of where we are and also respond to any questions. The other thing that I think uh, I want to ask Dr. Carvajal to do is to, there's some deadlines and dates that we must meet and we've met those thus far. One of the things I do not wish for us to have happen in this process is that we miss any deadlines that have been identified for us, whether it's about the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools or whether it's from the regions. Those deadlines are hard deadlines. They're not soft deadlines. They are demanding about this. We have two or three things that we have to look at. The regents, is that system is the governing body 
for all of public higher education in Georgia. We have about 10 million people, and this board governs and manages and controls all of public higher education. They give us really specific things that we must know and be able to do to respond to them. The second thing, the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools, they also accredit us that any school that's open now for, for business have to be accredited. So with the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools, there are certain dates that we must meet with them. So this is an extraordinary complicated process. It's complicated not just from the moving parts, but it's complicated because communities around the state of Georgia are complicated. We're not like Gwinnett County. We're not like Middle Georgia. We're not like Forsyth County, nor are we like Dahlonega. Albany, Georgia is a very different place. So every consolidation ha has had to take into the place uh, uh, that they reside in. We've done the same thing here, which means we've gone beyond just the usual things that they have done at other places, which is maybe use the, the website and technology, but we have been in front of a lot of people talking about this process. And what we'll do today is to uh, give you this broad overview that I've given you, then I'll ask Richard to talk about some of those deadlines, anything else he wishes to say, and then we'll open it up for questions. So with that, Richard, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Art. It's, uh, one of the things he did just now was to give you some of the background that we've been working on as well as to start to get into some detail, and I, I, I wanna echo what Art said. We will open it up to questions in just a second, so start thinking about what those questions are. We're happy to get into more details. But before we do that, I, I just wanna touch on and summarize some of the questions that we've been getting. As there really are two primary questions that that we have gotten, and, and, and Art alluded to this, we go out and we talk to a lot of groups. Uh, we're, we're kind of the new comedy duo of, of Albany, Georgia, I think. And, and so we go out and visit with a lot of groups and, 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 give, and give them a lot of information, both, uh, both, both on campuses as well as within the community. And uh, when we go out and do that, inevitably we hear a couple questions. The, the first one often is centered around, particularly in the community, why did this happen? Why, did, why did, was this decision first made? And then they want to know how, how it's going. So I'm just going to spend a second touching on those, anticipating that there, may, there still may be questions lingering in this room about particularly the first one and then certainly more recently the second. And to answer that first question of why was this done, that's really a two-part question uh, because there is the issue of why, why are we doing consolidations at all in the university system? As Art alluded to, this is the seventh such consolidation. They started really about four years ago, so why are we doing them? And then why particularly this one? And if you go back in time, about four years, we had a, a new chancellor, Hank Huckabee, who had just taken office, and in his first meeting with the Board of Regents, he gave a set of remarks in which he laid out what were going to be priorities of his administration in time. And one of the things then, uh, he coined a phrase that he has used, and Art and I have heard it a million times since, and he, he says it in every address he ever gives, he talked about a new normal for higher education. And what he alluded to was that we were not going to be able to just continue to do things the way we had been doing them, and, and largely that was driven by external market forces. And, and he, he elaborated on that by talking about the extent to which we have seen over the last decade plus dramatic cuts in higher education funding at the state level. And for those of us that think it's just happening in Georgia, no, this is, is truly a national phenomenon. In this state, for example, we've gone from roughly 50% of the cost of a student's education being funded by our tax dollars, by the allocation, to about a quarter of the cost of an education, of a student's education being funded. Now, our costs didn't go away. Those of us who work for one of these institutions, you all still want to get a paycheck, right? All right, we still got to keep the lights on, we still got to pay those bills, we got to pay insurance bills, we got all these things that we have to keep doing. Our costs really haven't changed. In fact, as insurance costs have gone up, particularly our costs have risen. And yet our funding source was consistently being eroded. Well, how in that decade period was that loss of available funds covered? Well, it was covered on the backs of our students. We had significant tuition increases year over year, again, not just in Georgia, but across the country. And what Chancellor Huckabee was referring to in that address was, 
was that the reality was he was being honest about that having happened, and he said, and he was right, that the market, i.e. our students, were starting to push back. That we couldn't just continue to assume that we could keep give, asking them to do more and more, and in fact, that rate at which we'd been asking them to do more had far exceeded inflation for a decade, and we certainly couldn't do that. And so we were gonna have to find a way to do things differently and do them more efficiently. And they started down the process, he, he, he mentioned the word that day, consolidation, as one of the options that the system would look at in order to find the efficiencies that were needed to live in this new normal. And you know that uh, just a few months later, they, they launched the first set of consolidations. By all accounts, those went well. So they did another one, they did another one, and then it brought us to the action that the board took in November that Art referred to here that we all know as the consolidation we're going through now. So why that one? Why did they then make that decision as the seventh consolidation? And we have been working along with the CIC, with the Carl Vincent Institute. I think most folks in this room are familiar with the Vincent Institute. Uh, they do demographic work, they do trending work, based out of the University of Georgia. Frankly, for what they do, they're probably the absolute best in the country. And we've had the pleasure of working with them to really delve into the 26 county, what we call catchment area of southwest Georgia, essentially draw a line from Columbus to Macon and the county south of that. Because that's predominantly where our collective students, ASUs and Darton students, come from and have for, for a long time. So what, what do we know about that area? Well, Art's alluded to the extent to which we're one of the poorest congressional districts, but they certainly went further than that. And they started looking at various indicators. What we know, for example, is that our unemployment rates have consistently been below arrest, the rest of the state. They were markedly below the rest of the state before the Great Recession. When we went into the Great Recession, the rest of the state dropped, but guess what, so did we. We stayed at a pretty even drop level, uh, but below the rest of the state. And then the Great Recession, our economists at least say, has ended. And we've come out of that, not everyone totally agrees with that, but that's what economists say. And as we've come out of that, Hey, the good news is the rest of the state has recovered. The bad news is that here in Southwest Georgia, we've actually recovered at a slower rate than the rest of the state. And so, as I've told some folks in the past, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I have been known to watch Dr. Phil occasionally. What's he call insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Essentially, what the board was saying was that's what we've been doing in higher ed in Southwest Georgia, and we're not seeing it. Unemployment's not changing. They look at the percentage of young people in our public schools who are getting free and reduced lunch. The absolute worst code they will give to a county is when 81% or more of the young people in that county are getting free or reduced lunch. Almost every of the 26 counties in southwest Georgia is colored red in that absolute worst category. And, the, and it went on and on and on in terms of the statistics they gave us, and there's several CIC members in the room and they know what I'm talking about. It could not have been clear that what, what we had been doing, trying to do things the same way for a long time, wasn't working, and if we were gonna make a sizable impact on the economic vitality of the region, we were going to have to make some changes. And this was a, the board's attempt to launch that, to think what could happen with a synergy of talent, of resources and energy around higher education, what could that do to spur on economic growth and vitality? And we have examples from throughout the state, and in fact across the country, where we know that that can work. So how's it going? I told you that was the other question that we get a lot. And, and I, what I would tell you, I'll answer that by telling you the answer I gave. We, we did an employee forum, I did one for the DART employees a couple of weeks ago, and the last question I got in the Q&A was, Richard, what has surprised you the most in the time that you've been here? And it, it was fascinating because literally just that day I'd been having lunch with an old friend who had come in to visit and I'd gotten that question from him so it was fresh in my mind. And I said, well, I'll tell you what I said to somebody at lunch today and that was, I have been surprised that it has gone as well and, and as fast as it has. We knew what a challenge this would be when we started down this path in November. We knew that it wasn't gonna be bump free. But we have been very, very pleased at the amount of work that has happened internal to the institutions. Art referenced the mission statement that was done. You also, you know that that's one of four foundational documents that ultimately will be released to, to, to everyone that include not just that, but a, guide, a set of guiding principles, a vision statement, 
and a statement of collective history that tell the full story of both where we've been, the foundation we've built on, as well as where we're going. You know that we have begun serious work on putting together a senior organizational chart that can help us push for the kind of excellence going forward that we believe this institution needs to have. And we have seen a lot, a tremendous amount of support from the business and leadership community of Albany, Doherty County, and Southwest Georgia. In many cases, folks who originally back in November were against this when they first heard about it are now some of our strongest, ad, ad, strongest advocates for why this has needed to happen. So again, going back to November, did I, did I anticipate, did Art anticipate, did any of us anticipate that we'd be where we're at today, here in early May, that the amount of progress that we've been able to make collectively would have happened? I would tell you, I, I didn't anticipate that. I've been positively surprised with that level of progress. We feel great about that. Are we done? No, we still got an awful lot of work to do. Most of those 800 decisions that Art referenced still have to be made, so let's, let's talk about some of the timelines going forward, and then again, we're gonna open it up to your questions. We had a big deadline to hit of getting that mission statement done by the March board meeting, because it really started the trigger for everything else. And we knew the timeline, we knew that was the first piece. And that had to get done in order for the folks who are working on developing what we call a prospectus with our Southern Association of Colleges and Schools. That is a required document that, that essentially describes to them the new university we are trying to create. That was the first piece that had to get done. It had to get done then if we were going to have a chance of meeting the next big de deadline, which is that that, that that report, that prospectus, is due to SACS by September 15th. Well, I'm, I'm pleased we were able to get that done in March, and I'm very pleased, as is Art, with the progress that that group that's working on that has made. We are very confident we're going to hit that deadline of getting that in by September 15. Assuming that happens, then we send it to SACS. They have their annual meeting in, mid -de in December, early December, and they meet twice a year, but in early December, we anticipate being on their agenda, and that is the group that has to then approve this idea of the new Albany State University. So again, we hit the September 15th date, it goes to vote in early December, assuming they pass it, and we have no reason to believe they won't. Every, everything we've been doing in that process has been going very, very well, the feedback has been great. So assuming they pass it, then within 30 days of that action, our Board of Regents, our governing board, has to, according to the bylaws of SACS, take action to approve the action that SACS has taken, and that is what finalizes this consolidation. At that point, we become one Albany state. So again, early January 17th. Now, will everything be done when that vote happens on that day? Will, will every part of our operations be put together? No, that work will probably continue for some time, certainly in lead up to next fall. But a lot of work has to get done and will get done between now and January and to the public at that point we'll be very happy to be one ASU going forward. So I hope that gives you a sense of where we're at in timeline, and with that, uh, I think we'll, we'll take any questions that you have. I know that we can hear you, but we actually, I think, are streaming it to others and so, that, so that they can hear you. That's why we're gonna bring the mic around. I hope that makes sense. Thank you, yeah. good morning. I was looking at the uh, ASU info. They listed all the coaches for both teams. And I noticed the uh, men's soccer team at Darton wasn't one of the sports that we're going to continue. Uh, traditionally, uh, and I'm from Albany, Georgia, sir. Uh, Darton has had a very good soccer men's program. And we have a, over here at Albany State University, we, we have a very good men's football program. A lot of students who play soccer uh, have, are traditionally in this area have been uh, white students or international students. And I was wondering, are we gonna consider later on bringing that sport back or what was the reason for not bringing that, keep, keeping that sport? I'll let you respond and then I'll. Okay. All right, so, uh, there was a, a process in place, literally that predates consolidation, uh, by a good bit, of trying to make sure at Darton that we could afford the number of athletic teams that the institution was fielding. And you know there was a large number and then it's become a much smaller number. 
And just like here at ASU, the funding for that, and this is required by the way the statutes are written related to our funding, has to be generated separate from the state allocation. Okay. So we have a student athletic fee just as ASU does here. And unfortunately, as we were putting things together, we realized we just couldn't continue to support all the number of sports we had there at Darton with the amount of funds that were being generated by the athletic fee. So we had to make hard decisions there. And I say we, I was not part of the institution there, but I'm certainly familiar with the process they went to and I'm supportive of it. They made the right decisions, hard decisions, but the right decisions in order to bring, to be able to make ends meet, all right? And then when we, when the consolidation was announced, there was a process that was led about thinking about what exactly would we have going forward, and I'll let Art comment on that. Yeah. You making, you and I stood in the hallway a couple of days ago and talked about this. And I like the idea of what you just said, is as we become one campus, those sports that attract people from around the world, how do we add in Southwest Georgia an extraordinary amount of diversity where it becomes a rich environment or a richer environment for students of all backgrounds. And sports, athletics is one way to do that. But what has become so clear, as Richard has just described, is clear for me in this job. I do not see how we can sustain athletics without private giving. There's no way that we can go forward at Albany, Darton, Georgia Southwest, and Valdosta without supporters beginning to redefine what giving looks like. When I was in the system office in Atlanta, the state paid 75% of what it cost to educate a student, and the student only had to come up with 25%. It's now about 50-50. So when the chancellor talks about a new normal, the new normal is also a fiscal reality. The things that we cannot do. And we also have to move beyond the notion that private giving means I can give you $100 and don't call me for the next 20 years. That's, that is so far from the reality of where we are right now. And I would need your help, Antonio and others, to say, as we discuss this new normal, how do we redefine what public support of higher education, what does that mean? Because it's not just athletics. It may be for the arts. It may be for music. Dr. Proctor had Saturday night, Friday night, and Thursday night one of the most extraordinary plays I've seen for young people here on this stage. I do know that many professors on this campus do things out of their pocket because we have not had the sort of what I call the, the support of the arts, support of athletics, and also how we change our way of thinking about this. We also cannot continue to come to athletic events and think there are a lot of free tickets. So many people have said to me, can I, can I have a ticket? And I, by the way, I don't want to pay for it. And, and keep parking the same amount. What I need for all of us to all of us to understand, and I did not realize that this is not something I knew ahead of time until I got in this position. And it has caused me to begin to be a donor in ways that I never thought I would because I see like these two students here, in this job, this is why we're here. And so the same thing for athletics. So if you have ideas of how we redefine what public support looks like for public higher education, I need for you to help us with that because one of the things I have noticed is this, this desire to think we are state supported. We are far from that now. Many universities have moved from state supported to state assisted. I would make the case that across this nation, as Richard alluded to, higher education, because of the demands of how much it costs to keep the lights on, to pay salaries, about 80% of what we have here is into salaries. And so we're in a very different place. And the sort of perspective that people have about don't change anything, you cannot do this, you can't do that, that is so far over. And so I need for all of us to begin to think how do we communicate with others, with, it, with ourselves, that in order for these students to be successful and be very competitive, it's going to require us moving beyond what the state does, whether it's in the arts, whether it's in music, whether it's in sports. And that's, we're not there yet because I still on an annual basis talk to people who think that the state is providing full support for everything we do. That is completely not the reality right now. And it's, and it's a tough environment that we're in. And that is why, and I'll make this one final point and get to another question, is when we do not retain students, everybody you see on this campus who's a student, they have an impact on our budget. 
when we do not retain these students and lose students on an annual basis, our budget goes down. When our budget goes down, we cannot keep the same amount of people employed. When we don't have the customer service and students have choices to go somewhere else and they leave us, they're leaving us with a budget deficit. Because when they're here and the numbers go up, our budget goes up. That is a reality that I'm finding that is not as clear. And what I try to do in ways, and I think every president in the system do, is to talk about this in a way where people don't feel like you, you know, you're browbeating, but this, this, the state has so many demands to support all across the state of Georgia. We're about 10 million people. We are just one state entity trying to get a case made to get support for public higher education. And so if you can help us think through how we do this in a very different way, that's the reality of it. It's, it's, there's nothing mysterious about this. And so you hitting the nail on the head, I'd love to do exactly what you just said, but he really spelled it out. How much can we afford? And can we stop putting it all on the backs of students? Because if the, what supports this is the student activity fee for our kind of campus. Good morning. I got a question. Um, what would happen to the um, Darden, stu Darden students when the um, consolidation uh, occurs? Would they um, have the option to come to Albany State student or would they have to transfer? As you've heard, and I think in both of our comments, we are, we've become one campus. So the concept of Darden students and Albany State students with the consolidation goes away. And what we would hope is that, as they've done at the other campuses, if we have a lower division open access, and some of this will, is still in process to be worked out, but those students are Albany State students. We will continue to try to offer those programs that lead directly to employment, but also lead directly to the bachelors. What I'm hoping for is that we have so many students who would transfer, and by the way, Darton is the number one school already for transfers into Albany State. I did not know that. So the, the two-year colleges around this state where we get the students who transfer in, the majority comes from Darton. But we will become one in the campuses, Albany State University. And, and so they will become ASU students. Just to add to that, this is one of the beauties of this consolidation. And it's one of the reasons that it was done is for Darton students, it opens up a world of new opportunities. Not only was the, the, the highest feeder to ASU, Darton, but if you look at, as Darton a transfer institution, if you look at where our students transfer to, by far the top transfer destination was ASU. So all this is doing is, is, is making that seamless. Uh, you don't have to reapply now to a new institution. And that in fact you get to seamlessly within the same institution and using the same functions that you got used to using when you came in as an access student, you'll be able to continue up. I, I, one of the questions I get a lot is, well if I'm a Darton student now, are you going to get rid of my program? Will I not be able to finish? No, absolutely not. We're going to make sure that the students there not only are able to finish, but we're going to try to make sure it's real clear uh, how easy it will be to continue on. The other thing I'd add to that, as a state university, we have people here with extraordinary backgrounds in higher education, some of the most outstanding faculty I've seen. What I'm hoping that we can do is not just look at the current programs we have, but can we be innovative and creative and connect, and I'll just use one, the, the arts and technology. How do you connect disparate and diverse programs in ways that it gives people a very rich opportunity for some fascinating jobs that are out there? I would hope that at some point soon that we look at, as Richard alluded to, the new academic programs open up in a new world, but that new world should not just be exactly what we have now, but some of the most boundary monitoring pushes out there, how technology interfaces with um, music. How, you know, if, if I'm want, interested in being working in a museum, how do I get the business side of the museum? If I want to be a museum curator, a museum to operate, say, the High Museum, what do I need in ASU's business school in the way of management classes to do that? That we begin to have these sort of deep, deep, diverse conversations about the nature of what's happening in America and how does that impact Albany State and what are we doing with students. One of the things I've noticed on every campus I've been on, this concept of silos. You're not going to get anywhere in this new normal that the Chancellor talked about by staying in your area and not talking to anybody and thinking you can be successful and you don't care what happens to anybody else. That's not, that's not going to work. So if you still have that mindset 
And one of the things I'm hoping we can do for this new campus is to leverage other campuses in this system, things that we don't have, that we can build a relationship, but bring it to the Albany State students because we have a relationship. And I'll give you one good example. If a campus has a, a campus in China, one in Austria, or one in East Africa, we don't have the money to do it, but our students can go because we build an MOU relationship. So it doesn't mean you have to build a bridge on everything. Some of you just build a relationship, and the students can behave as if they have this on campus. For us as a campus, that's where we, we need to go with it. There's too much happening across this nation and in this system that Albany State students need to benefit from, and I am just determined to make sure that happens, not just trying to find money to do it all the time, but build a relationship where the same outcome is, 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 is as if we have it. Okay. Hello. Hey, how are you doing? I was just wondering if there would be like a, because you guys talk about budget a lot, is there a strategic plan that you guys have? Because I know for, in my perspective, I know that for a university to thrive, there would have to be um, a successful like athletic program. So I feel as though if you take away those sports, then you take away the people in the different areas away, you know, so they won't be able to come to the school because I know there's no um, tuition barrier, like out of state tuition for like Florida, Alabama. There's a multitude of alumni chapters in Miami for Albany State and in the Alabama areas because I've lived in Miami and I know there's a lot of people who they used to get back in the 90s who came from um, Miami. So, and that's a very diverse area, so what are you guys gonna do when you take everything like that away? That's an excellent question. I was in Miami three weeks ago and met with ASU alumni chapter down there. And the man who organized the visit, Antonio, was Ransom Hill. And he was on the last team that was undefeated at Albany State and they did not get scored on it. ASU, I think in the early 60s. And Ransom still looks like he could suit up. Um, he, but they, he invited me down, and I was in the room with a young woman from the Miami area. And her dad came up to see me and said, Dr. Dunning, my daughter is persistent. And she's one of the top 25 basketball players in, in the greater Miami area. He said, but I'm having trouble getting people to respond back from your campus. And she said, but this is my baby girl. And she won't let up. She wants, she would like to come to Albany State. And so can you help me? So I got on the phone with my cell and called one of our senior leaders here on campus and could you talk to this dad? And the dad suggested to me, he, had, he was ready to give up on us. But the daughter was unwilling to have that to happen. The point I'm making in this is that Two things, we're not gonna put the athletic program on the back of students. I suggest it to you, we'll have to raise some money and do giving. But second, those great students who wish to come here, we have to treat them like some of these large universities treat linebackers who are 6'5 and 265 pounds. That they were, they're relentless trying to recruit them. This is a young woman that I thought we should be all over trying to get her to, uh, to Albany State. All he was telling me is one of the things that you've heard me talk about a lot, and it's not an Albany State issue. Richard has talked about it at Dart and other presidents, this concept of service to our students and service to our community, which means that we have to behave like a for-profit organization. We are a non-profit. So if you behave like a for-profit organization, that's a customer. That means I've got, I'm going very quickly to get this young woman. So I sat there and said, please don't give up on us. Let's hang in there with us and we'll get all the information that you need. That's happening all over this state and for campuses like ours, that's, that's a death blow for us because the dad does not keep that narrative to himself. He probably talks to other fathers and mothers in the Miami area. So all I'm suggesting to you two things. One is the operational processes we have and the second, what I've alluded to with uh, Mr. Leroy, is that the, there are limits to resources, there are limits to the amount of money we have, and if we want to put a product on the field, 
It's not going to come from state dollars, and I'm not ethically, ethically going to put it on the backs of these students. They, pay, they have enough money coming out of their pocket. They, they leave with too much debt. If I could do one thing and wave a wand, I would say to our students, get the money from financial aid that you need to pay your tuition, but don't get so much money you can go out to the mall and spend it and still owe it. If I could do one thing to convince our students, when you get these refunds, keep in mind there's going to be a day of reckoning. You're going to have to pay that money back because you put a social security number in here to get the money, but don't get more than you need. Get what you need, pay your college expenses, because I don't want to see you or think about you at 35 years of age still trying to pay off a college loan, a college debt. And so that speaks to all of us who love Albany State is to redefine what support means for us. And, I, and when I talk to people about this, I'm not pressing you about a dollar amount. I'm not pressing you about, I'm just saying look within your heart and make sure your actions are consistent with your giving. Because many people say that I, I love the campus, but I'm not supporting you. And so what I was trying to communicate to you back here, you absolutely, Miami is an area where that was a great turnout when I was down there, the ASU alumni chapter. And the last I'll mention is Washington, D.C. I was in D.C. about a, maybe 10 days ago for the ASU alumni visit. I could walk out of this restaurant and look down and see the U.S. Capitol. These were ASU grads. One was working and head of global health of the U.S. Navy, ASU grad. Another one uh, was working for the CIA. And then we had one working for the Secret Service. That's the story that should be told in the Albany, Georgia area. Because there's some high-end people who come through this campus. We've had people who go to medical school. Dr. Billy Black has two had a daughter and a son here who are physicians who went to ASU. And we also have many folks who've gone to law school. As we go through this consolidation, we're trying to put a new narrative out here about what this campus is like and what the opportunity is for a Darden student and for the existing ASU student. But you on target, there's a whole lot of passion tied up in athletics. I mean, I noticed that, and also the arts. I noticed the people who were so intense about this Romeo and Juliet play. The things we do that are publicly visible, we need to think about how we turn that into the energy and passion that people on the outside have for us and how we can get them to know we are state assisted and we don't get all the money from the state of Georgia to pay all the bills and the salaries that we have here. You have to help us with that. And when I'm talking about this, or Richard is talking about it, it's almost as if you expected to say this, you may not have enough data to believe it, but I'm telling you the reality is we, there's nothing that we're saying to you that you can't go and find out for yourself. And so that's, that's the new definition, and I think you are right on target. People love sports in America, and they especially love it in the South. And so what we've got to figure out is how do we use that, the football program. And I'll, I'll start with this and respond to another question. I go to our football game. And we are a Coca-Cola state. This is not a knock on anybody. But we are a Coca-Cola state. We should have a Coke sign over here at the end of our field that's elegant, that you can see from any place in the stadium. But I challenge anybody here to go and look at that sign and see if they can figure out what the score is. I challenge anybody, next, the next football, just look at the sign. Now, what, what I'm saying to you, Coca-Cola's in Atlanta, it's an international headquarters. I've been a lot of places around the world. One of the things I see consistent is a Coke sign, whether it's Venezuela, whether it's East Africa, or anywhere, there's a Coke sign. So this is our home state. So were I in a position to do this, and I'd go be right in North Avenue saying, we're gonna become a Coke campus. And by the way, in order for, you, for us to do that, we want you to put, Videotron or whatever they call those things, where you can see replays and see and have a very elegant. Mr. Christian knows it. We've, we looked at that and I said, can you tell me what the score is? Because I can't make it out. <laughs> I promise you that. And, and I say that with, with, with all great due respect and, and some humor about this. That, but that's an example. Don't normalize this. And all you have to do is go up there and just make a hard case and be persistent about it. We are consumers of products. This is not a social experiment that I'm asking you to help us with this. We are, we are, this is a business operation. So that's, you're right, that's, that's where we are. 
So if you come to the game, and you want a great athletic experience, not that, as Mr. Leroy used to do, run touchdowns, but you also want to have the amenities and see it, that sign is one of them. So those are the things I think we need to begin to examine and ask ourselves. Another question. All right. <clears throat> Good morning, Dr. Dunn, uh, Mr. Richard. Uh, Mr. Richard, you had said, um, you made a statement about we got 800 decisions left to make where you guys do. My question is, when it comes to making those decisions, even though you have the consolidation team and, you know, Dr. Dunn has his leadership team, with the students, um, if there are decisions that our voices can be heard, would you guys give us those deadlines and that information ahead of time so, you know, like, all these protesting that we're doing so that could stop the protesting? Because uh, it's real like a lack of communication, you know what I'm saying? So, I, th I think two things, and that was, you brought up, we have now an advisory committee, because one of the things I've done to the dismay of people in my office, if a student comes by and I'm not doing something, I'll stop doing what I'm doing and talk. So they get a little upset with me about that. These guys here know that they come by sometimes with things on their mind. But I realized that was ad hoc. It was not systematic. And so we put together an advisory committee um, that broadens the representation to do exactly what you said. One of the things I've learned that many communities around the world, many communities in this nation, if you don't have facts and information, you'll fill in with two areas, gossip and innuendo. And so I realized we were kind of being bombarded with some things. So we created this advisory committee, and I asked the students about two or three things, the quality of life for ASU students. What is it that we can do to strengthen who you are and what this result would be? We used a model, and we've said this back to the folks in the system, of the model that you've used at these six other places may not work for Albany, and that was to add the ASU SGA person and the Darden SGA person. We realize now that's not big enough. That's not big enough. So what you're describing and what we hope we'll be able to do is the 12 or 15 people we've added for this advisory committee is to have a more intense briefing with you about those things that impact students. That as we work through this process, how do we make sure that that voice is given? Because every six, I mean the other six, I think they only had two students on the CIC, one from each of the respective campuses. We realize for us that's not the workable model. And so I hear you loud and clear on that. And one of the things that I'm hoping, first of all, I like, I like for students to, to uh, show passion because when, when I was where you are today, my passion was I am going to get everything I do, everything I can to get the stench of Jim Crow out of the South. I'm, I'm not having served this country, I'm not going, you're not going to push me out of anything. And as a student, I took no prisoners about that. Very serious man about saying no university in this nation can define me and push me back because of my color. That was my passion. The other passion was, is that voting. People, I overuse this, but it's instructive. Birmingham, Alabama thought it was okay to turn dogs and hoses on teenagers and to kill four young girls, not quite teenagers, in a Baptist church in Birmingham. So my context, my passion almost made me somewhat dysfunctional. That's how intense I was about this. And so going in the military kind of helped me with that. I'm excited when students show passion. But what, what you have now is an environment where there's a need to be full participants in the conversation, which is what you're describing, and to help me and others say, what does rigor look like on this campus? Are we pushing you enough? Are the classes giving you enough rigor? How about what happens after five o'clock that you have access to in terms of quality of life? What happens on the weekend? And what I say to students who come out of the office, it's not in the sand trap, it's not in the state theater. The juke joint is not what it used to be. So guys, y'all are going to get hurt in that. You're going to get hurt in these places. So that means we have a responsibility here to, to help, help you as young people do the things that you normally like to have a good time. But there are places right now, and Chief Fields, I don't know if he's in the room, but he, he keeps up with making this as a safe campus. 
And when things fall apart for students, he sends out who got arrested. And you students have heard me say this, and this is tied to where I want you in the conversation. If you are across the river being fingerprinted and put in a database, I take that as personal pain almost for me because I know what that does in this nation called misdemeanor or felony, and you are a college student. You have done something that's real serious to your future as a consequence there. So I want you to help me understand how do we retain you? What is it that we're doing that causes you to stay here and have a good story? That's a conversation for us, not a conversation of the president talking to somebody. Or you talking back. This is a collective discussion that we must have. And you need to be at the table to do that. And that means we have to broaden the discussion. And that's what we've chosen to do. And when the other six, we followed what they were saying, and then we realized that we got in it. Those things that they did at the other six, they don't work for Albany, Georgia. They don't work for ASU and Darden. So I hear you loud and clear on that. And I think we'll schedule a meet with our advisory group probably in the next five to seven days. And uh -huh. Yeah, and, and that's something when, when we have our next meeting, I want you to, what you've just described is what I consider information dissemination. For you, and where I may be still an email person, whether you're talking Instagram or something else that I don't quite understand. You know, how, how do we communicate in ways that making sure that everybody gets it. Because as you will see in these discussions, there's no perfection in human existence. You get some things right, you get some things wrong, you don't get it right, you take a step back and fix it. And that's what we did with this process that people said to us, here's, here's the process. And once we got in it, we said, that's not working for us. So we had to change some things. And so, no, I want you, the thing that I'm looking for is an aggressive, assertive, passionate voice backed up by data, facts, and information. If you could do that, have, have an aggressive, assertive, passionate voice, but you, you back it up with data and information and what you've found out, then we're good to go. Okay? Uh, I just wanted to ask if we anticipate our SACS um, approval in, from the December meeting, when would, and we become one Albany state, when would we actually start registering as one body of students for our faculty and our programs? Talk, we are, it will happen in phases, is what I would say, is that we have already, our academic leaders have worked to align our academic calendars, actually somewhat starting in the fall, fully by spring. Uh, but we're still going through the process of how do you go through the full registration process what we've learned from, there's a lot of lessons learned from the other consolidations. One of the biggest takeaways is that financial aid is tough. Well, it's always tough, but it's particularly tough in consolidation in terms of trying to make sure that you do it right and you don't harm students as we're going through this. So we're, we, are, we have been having consultants from the USG and other institutions come down and work with us to begin that transformation and I would think it would happen in phases. So we might see parts of the institution, again, big parts, aligned as early as January. There might be other parts, such as full registration alignment and, and particularly financial aid that might not happen until fall. We're getting, Wendy, I think we're getting close. Yes, we are. Do you, are there additional comments that you'd like Just, to make? We'll make some closing comments, and then I will as well. Let me do a, a couple of things. One is, Everyone here, thank you for being here. And I want to tell you, this is probably the most difficult experience I've had in my life for two reasons. One, any consolidation of very diverse organizations that have been around as long as we both have, it's complicated. And it's difficult, just the mechanics and the operations of a process. What I've learned in talking with the other presidents who've been through the other six, the cultural aspects are very complicated. Universities are like communities, like families. There's some things that people stand for. So when you begin to have this sort of coming together, uh, it, it makes for a heavy responsibility for everybody involved 
to try to take a deep breath and take a step back and see how, what this future can look like. And many of you who know me and know me well, and I alluded to this early on, is the isolation that you can have and what you think about and the people you know. And many things I talk about, I've had to kind of navigate through some of those uh, as a life experience, having not been out of a section of the state until age 18 and, and then going to East Asia, I, I, I shudder to think what would happen had I not been able to leave that community to get out of the state of Alabama as outrageous and egregious some of the things that's going on. So when I got out, I was able to, uh, to reflect and understand what was going on back home with, uh, in Mississippi and places like that, when there was some pushing back and some killing. And so at age 18 to 22, I was able to get yanked out of that by the U.S. military, because I probably would have, like a lot of young folks in college, as you're talking, would probably hurt myself in that process. That's how intense I was about this sort of desire to change. That's a cultural issue. Jim Crow now doesn't exist. We're in a very different place. So I have a great deal of empathy for people on all sides when they just look at this and say, who thought this was a good idea? Why did they do this to us? And what they're really saying on all different sides about this, this may not be the best thing, but we know the rules. This thing works. And what Richard alluded to, people who look at us and say, we can't keep doing the same thing in Southwest Georgia and expect a different result. It's not going to work. So you have a challenge in public higher education right now of looking at one of the poorest sections in the country and to try to do something about it. I'm an intensely commit competitive man. It's, it's, it's just my deep instincts is to be competitive. I don't like it when I'm sitting with Congress of Bishop and we talk about this. What can we do for the second congressional district that makes a difference in the next 12 to 15 to 20 years for the people in this area? One of them is to get higher education right, is to get what I call places where things of the mind occur, where you learn at the highest level. Let's try to get this right where those things that tear at us, that we, we may not be happy about it and what the regents did, but I will make the case they gave us an opportunity and the conversation, Birmingham chose one direction, Atlanta chose another. Atlanta had a mayor named Ivan Allen Ivan Allen Boulevard is in Atlanta. He was the only Southern mayor who went to Washington, D.C. to testify in support of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Everybody else said, not going to happen. We don't want it to happen. Birmingham chose the avenue of, we don't want that airport. Put it in Atlanta. Even though we're the geographical center of the South, we don't want outsiders coming into our community, changing us. And we have an industrial blue-collar town with coal, Coke, steel, they were the Pittsburgh capital of the South, is what they call themselves. Now Atlanta is an international city. It all boils down to the fork in the road that they took in Atlanta versus Birmingham. I would make the case to us that the regions have given us a fork in the road. Albany, Georgia, there are going to be some people 30 years from now discussing who, what we did in 2016. And it's going to generate an outcome. You go to the bank on this one. What we're doing today will generate an outcome. Either it's going to be constructive and positive or something else will happen. I am determined, and I think what we're seeing is a lot of goodwill as people, the more people hear this, the more we talk about it, the more people begin to understand this is, this, the stakes are pretty high for us. The stakes are very high. And what I would encourage you to do, because you are a different place, and my anger was dysfunctional anger as an 18-year-old, and the way I got a handle on it, it was nothing I did. Folks that sent me abroad to serve this country. I, they, I, just, I got put out of here for two years. And I was over there for a while, unable to breathe. I don't know what would have happened had I stayed. I'm serious about that. And so I, I get the fact that this change can be extraordinarily dramatic for a lot of people, but I'm making the case there's an outcome here and we're beginning to see a whole lot of people who can begin to think about this. Because if you're at Albany State and you have a job, 
you have retirement, and you have health insurance. You're part of a privileged citizen of the world. You may not believe it, but if you have a job, you have retirement, and you have health insurance, you're better than most people in this world. And so I, can, I tell anybody, I can take that and play that all day long if I have that. So I'm encouraging us to think now, if you have this, turn around and serve somebody else. Turn around and serve your community. That's what this is all about. If you can do that, then I think we'll get through this. And we'll get through and do it well. Richard, anything else you want to add? Thank you for being here. Wendy, anything, any final no, instructions? I just want to share with everybody again, uh, thank you, Dr. Dunning. Thank you, Dr. Carvajal, for your uh, comments today. Thank you to those who asked questions. Uh, this uh, town hall has been captured on video. And if there are some colleagues or some students that were not able to attend, please share with them that it will be on the website and also the consolidation page. Continue to check the uh, consolidation website for future updates, future town hall meetings, and um, wish you all a very great day. Thank you so much for your attendance.